Hey, and welcome back to Node Jam. So making games in Blender has been on my mind a lot lately. For example, a few months ago, I made a playable recreation of Wii Sports using Blender's real-time physics, and currently I'm developing a Blender-based game engine built almost entirely with geometry nodes. The game engine has been in development for around five months now, and I'm about ready to take on a more bite-sized project that I can actually finish quickly. So I gave myself 24 hours to make a fishing game in Blender, using no pre-made assets. I will use some of Blender's other systems for things like making the 3D models, but Geometry Nodes is the glue holding everything together. So let's take a look at the end result. The game is simple, and the only control is this slider, which you can move back and forth to cast and reel. When you see ripples appear, it means that a fish is on the line, and you can move the slider to catch the fish. If you reel in too quickly, the fish will get away though. There's a score counter on the edge of the pond that keeps track of your total fish and how many points you've accumulated. Each fish gives you points based on the type and the size. And if you're really lucky, you can catch a gold variation and get even more points. Your tackle box will change color as you gain more points. Less than 100 points and it's orange. At 100 points it turns purple. 250 points it turns green. 450 points and it'll be blue. 800 points tan and 1500 points and above, it's gold. And as far as gameplay goes, that's about it. With the limited time I had, I did pack as many small details as I could. So the character's eyes blink, the radio shows music notes that scale with the volume, and the bobber moves up and down when bitten. The process of developing this little game was really, really fun, and I think it was pretty interesting too, so I'd like to share a deeper dive into how I made it. Let's look at a couple numbers that make this game run. It's not a comprehensive list, but these seven things are the big ones that the geometry nodes are using behind the scenes. Starting with fish hook time, when you boil it down, one of, if not the biggest thing that makes fishing fun is the fact that you never know what you're going to get or when you're going to get a bite. Randomization is at the core of a fishing game, and that's the central idea I built my game on. To keep things more interesting and less predictable, there's variation on how long a fish can nibble on the hook. Pull velocity measures how much the input has changed from one frame to the next. It basically keeps track of how fast you, the player, are moving the pole, and if your velocity is above a certain value, then the fish gets away. It's important because it adds a little bit more finesse to the reel, rather than just moving the slider as fast as you can. Time sensed reel is basically a cooldown. During development, I noticed sometimes you would cast, and immediately a fish would be on the line, so I made a timer that keeps looping as long as the pole is reeled in, but stops looping when it's in the water, so this prevents a ripple from showing until that timer has stopped. Gotfish is the boolean that determines if your fish is on the hook. There are a bunch of features that need to be enabled or disabled based on what's happening in the game, and because of that there needs to be a value to control if a fish is eligible to be caught and switch the fish on or off accordingly. It's sort of the start of a catch, but it's not the only variable involved in successfully reeling in a fish. For example, the pull velocity is another factor. Fishing is more fun when there is a variety of different fish that you could catch, and the fish index is the number that determines what kind of fish you end up getting. The game has six different things to catch based on a randomly generated integer between zero and five. Each one has its own range of sizes that's controlled by the next number, fish value. So when you tell a friend you caught a fish this big, you're trying to impress them because you got lucky and caught an above average fish. You can catch a fish this big in my game too. Each fish gets a randomly generated value between 0 and 10 that determines additional info about that fish, including the length, the weight, and the score you get when you catch it. The likelihood of getting a higher value fish is lower than that of getting a medium fish. Instead of the fish probability being linear, it's based off of a curve, so fish are more likely to be in the middle of that range. This is also the value that determines if a fish is gold if that random number is above 9.75. Ripple count is an accumulated value of the total number of times a fish has nibbled on the hook. You have to use something as a seed to generate random numbers, so I use the ripple count so that each byte is different. Now that we have an idea of some of the systems, let's take a more detailed look under the hood at some nodes. 
To keep this video from becoming a boring slog for everyone but the most dedicated node nerds, let's just boil down most of what's happening to two things. First of which is switches and logic. So as I mentioned earlier, randomization is kind of the main thing that's going on with the nodes. But there are a few requirements for some of these numbers. First of which is the random value can't change once you catch a fish. So whatever the number is, it needs to stay that number until you start fishing again, or something like this will happen. The simulation zone lets us build some really cool switch mechanisms that allow us to keep a value static if another value is met. Let's take a closer look at a simplified version. We have a simulation zone with a switch inside, and if that switch is true, it lets this random number pass through. We can visualize the output of this system and see that every frame, a new random value between 0 and 1 is generated. But if we turn that switch off, whatever the value was when we flipped the switch keeps getting passed through until we turn the switch back on. Depending on our needs, we could plug the result of other systems into the switch. For example, if you have a node that detects when the pole is above water, it can stop that value from being updated. Much of the fancy stuff in this episode's project are built on this principle, just adding some more conditions or using different types of data. For example, a fish can only be caught if all of these three conditions are true. One, our pole is above water. Two, a fish was on the line when we started reeling in. And three, we didn't reach the maximum pole velocity. Someday I'd like to do a deeper dive into the amazing things you can do with these switches, but if you're curious, you can get the project file and tinker with it over on my Patreon. The second big thing that the nodes do is curves and animation. Some things in the scene, like the raccoon in the hammock, are animated with keyframes and loop forever, which is great because there's nothing the player can do that affects them. Some things in the scene need to move interactively though. The biggest example is the fishing pole and the bear's arm. It would look pretty lame if they did nothing when we used our pole, so there needs to be some dynamic animation. To do this in Blender is a little tricky because we can't just set an animation to play using geometry nodes based on what's happening in the game like you would be able to do with a game engine. To get around this though, we can do the animation entirely with nodes. These animations are best kept as simple movements from one place to the next, but for this game that's all we need. We can create a curve that defines the path our object will move along and set the object's position along that curve based on user input. Some other examples of these animations include the bobber moving up and down in the water and the bear and the raccoon blinking based on random numbers. These are also handled with nodes. Graphics definitely aren't everything in a game, but they are an important aspect of what makes a game enjoyable and memorable. I wanted to prioritize function, but still spend a good chunk of my 24 hours on making things look good. My materials are built with shader nodes to save time, increase flexibility, and of course they also fit in well with the whole node jam thing. I was aiming for a simple, stylized, and saturated look. The Voronoi texture is a perfect fit because you can get these abstract blocks of color that are really adjustable. When you pair the texture with a color ramp, you can change the colors and how much of each color there is. The water was one of my biggest visual priorities since it's what you're staring at most of the time when you're playing. This texture also has the added need of being animated, which is actually pretty simple. You just set the texture to 4D and add keyframes. To add more detail, I mixed a few types of textures together into a single material to give the water a more layered look. Specifically for the water, there are actually two almost identical textures, one called Pond Ripple and the other called Pond No Ripple. The geometry node systems can apply one of these two materials to the pond based on if a fish is biting or not. It's really rare that I take on a Blender project that I don't enjoy, and this definitely wasn't an exception. I think 24 hours was tight enough to keep things interesting, but compared to last episode where I only had 9 hours, I was able to take on a more ambitious project with the extra time. Not everything panned out the way I was hoping it would, but that's how things go, and honestly that's a big part of what makes it fun. I'm really happy with how everything turned out. There were a ton of things that I thought would have been cool to add, like different types of bait, a shop where you can sell fish in exchange for different rods, hats, and new types of tackle, and I also thought a time and weather system would be cool with certain fish being more likely in certain conditions. Also adding more fish would be pretty cool too. Maybe someday I'll revisit this project and add some of those features. 
I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.